Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this new interview on doing sociology. Today, we have with us R. Vasavi, who is a social anthropologist based in Karnataka. She has received her master's from the Department of Sociology, Delhi School of Economics, and her PhD in social anthropology from Michigan State University, USA. She was a faculty with the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, from 1997 to 2011 a senior fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, New Delhi, and visiting fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Diversity and Religion at Göttingen, Germany. Her academic interests are in sociology of India, agrarian studies, and sociology of education, and she has conducted field research in various parts of India. Her publications include Harbingers of Rain, Land and Life in South India, published by OUP in 1999, in an outpost of the global economy, edited with Kar Carol Upadhyay, Ratlesh 2008, The Inner Mirror, Translations of Kannada Writings on Society and Culture, The Book Review Press 2009, and Suicides and the Predicament of Rural India, Three Essays Collective 2012. In 2010, in collaboration with Padmini Swaminathan, she founded the Network for Rural and Agrarian Studies, which focuses on the continuous study and documentation of trends in rural India. The network has recently published the State of Rural and Agrarian India Report 2020, of which Vasavi is one of the co-authors. A collected volume of her essays on education is forthcoming. She is currently a member of the Punarchit Collective, which works on alternative learning and is based in Karnataka. Uh, welcome, ma'am. We're very happy to have you with us today. Thank you. Look forward to this. To uh, begin with... Uh, you know, the first questions we have for you is that in your work on agrarian distress, you have used the phrase web of risks uh, to talk about farmer suicides. Could you explain what it means and in what context uh, did you use it? Yeah. Uh, so basically, in uh, while conducting uh, you know, field research on the suicides, uh, just primarily first in Karnataka, but then I used a lot of secondary data from other sites and also visited some other states. I found that uh, most uh, most reports, especially the government-based reports, tended to associate suicides with psychological issues. And maybe sometimes the whole kind of high risk people were taking in terms of the economic situation where they had faced economic losses. I found both of these to be very inadequate. And uh, instead, I saw that there were a whole set of interrelated factors that acted as uh, very onerous uh, kind of conditions on most farmers, not just small and marginal farmers. But among the most uh, precarious farmers, uh, there was, or I think it still is valid, that there is a web of risks that is uh, set in. And this web of risk uh, relates to the risks that farmers have to take when accessing capital, because now, to be in agriculture, you need uh, capital, especially if it is from outside, mostly borrowed. Uh, so getting into debt uh, has, has become you know, inevitable. Uh, how to get the capital, what amounts of risks to pay, and whether they will get it at all, and if they get it to repay that capital, so the risk uh, associated with having access capital. So basically, the web of risks is related to the fact that agriculture itself is now increasingly capitalized. It is increasingly commercialized and also increasingly uh, chemicalized, all of which are you, know, you, you need money to gain or put in all these external inputs. So with that, there is also the risks of the market. Uh, which uh, many farmers uh, face, which is uh, when prices collapse, uh, you know, they would have uh, taken huge loans to grow something, maybe turmeric or bananas or some fruits, uh, expecting to have, you know, a good return, but the market collapses and they would either sell it at, you know, very low rates, it's not remunerative at all, or even go to extreme losses. For example, when the prices of tomatoes collapse and, you know, farmers, uh, think uh, or decide that it's not even worth harvesting those uh, uh, vegetables. So that is the kind of mar market risk they, they face. Along with that is the risk of knowledge because uh, new agriculture is defined so much by external inputs, what kind of fertilizers to use, kind of seeds to get, the pesticides to use, new technologies to use, all of which many are not well trained in. 
it's all hit and miss. Most of it comes from interlinked market, um, agri-business agents are promoting these without you know, full knowledge, etc. Uh, so there is all, also that risk uh, that they take. Uh, for example, like they're growing a new crop which they're not familiar with. Um, they may not use the right kind of fertilizers, the right uh, mixes or with excessive fertilizers, which is one of the reasons that cost of production goes high. So there is also that whole risk of knowledge. What do you know how to use the new inputs, even new technologies, whether it's drip irrigation now, how much water to even pump out from your tube well, et cetera. So it is risk related to knowledge. Then there is also the production risks, uh, which are uh, linked not only to the climate, but when they've used hybrid seeds, which are susceptible to diseases and pests, uh, sometimes or you know unseasonal rains or lack of rains, droughts, et cetera, they lose their crops. So production itself is never assured. You know, say for that, that is a very huge risk. You, you may have uh, put in a lot into your land expecting high returns, but uh, the returns are very low uh, itself. So that is the production risk. Finally, and I think uh, something that has become very uh, important and pressing over the past decade especially is the risk they face with climate change. Of course, now in the past two years, we've entered a phase of a climate emergency itself where the rainfall patterns have changed so drastically as we are experiencing it now. There's a long you know, cyclone on, very unseasonal rains have come, very high temperatures as much as North India and Western India is ex experiencing. So there is a whole... Um, this junction between the old cultivation patterns, uh, which is the seasonality of cultivation that they were familiar with, to the new kinds of rains, which actually completely disrupt the earlier cultivation patterns. So there is a risk of climate, climate uh, itself being very unreliable. So this is the web of risk that I kind of focused on to explain how farmers are snared or caught within this web of risk. And it is very, very difficult for them to, to come out of it. Right. So, uh, Professor Vasavi, do you also think that there is an interconnection between the web of risk as well as the individualization of risk? Yeah. I uh, uh, kind of uh, zeroed in on the individualization of agriculture and or agriculturists and uh, the individualization of risk uh, to explain how... Uh, uh, again, there is a shift from earlier farming uh, agriculture, which was not collective in the sense it was not like everybody owned the same resources and had the same knowledge, and et cetera. But even in an area where there were huge differences in access to resources and cows, agriculture was defined by agriculture people would have. For example, you know, some pulses that they would grow, how it was grown, etc. If if there was a drought or if there was excess rain, you know, floods or unseasonal rain, everybody would experience it the same way. But now what is happening is that farmers are cultivating or taking on to their parcels of land on an individual basis. Many are breaking away from you know larger joint families, becoming what are called entrepreneurial families. They, in fact, the, the step into this web of risk is when they become, take on these entrepreneurial activities, expecting that they would become what are called progressive and uh, therefore you know, lucrative farmers, uh, in that they then break away from that collective rhythm. Uh, for example, one first things that most uh, farmers you see is they break away, they might say, okay, Everybody in this belt is doing dry agriculture, but I will get a tube well and therefore I will have different types of crops. I'll grow some wet crops, which will be commercial. So there you, you've broken away from your neighbors, from the surroundings. Because of that, then you also engage with the market on an individual basis. Either the market has the bank or where you access capital or the interlinked markets, for example, the fertilizer, seed dealer, who also acts as the agent who procures, gets the grains uh, in return. Uh, treats that person on an individual basis, not as a collective, as a member of a group, a farm, a farming sector, or somebody from a particular uh, village with some backing, but as an individual who is responsible and who is accountable to this, either to the bank or to the agent, as an individual. So it is here that I see that uh, when the uh, going gets tough, for example, they've taken loans, they're not able to pay back, there is no fallback, there is no social security 
a group in which it is collectively shared becomes very, very individualized, very isolated, and therefore those risks then have to be borne by the individual uh, himself. Mostly, it's, again, it's men. So it is that it is in that context where losses become, you know, very heavy, heavy, he difficult to bear. You have no one else to share it with. Um, loss of face because you're not able to repay your debts. Um, when the creditors come, you know, calling, they, they pick on you and your family alone. Um, you also have to negotiate the market alone. Uh, go, go, you know, as an individual and say, see whether the rates are right or not, or even negotiate all the difficulties that they would uh, face. So it is, it is in that context that I zeroed in on how the shift from shared agriculture to a uh, much more commercial capitalistic agriculture also places and a burden on the individual, and that is why I've called it individualization of agriculture and individualization of risks also. Right. So my next question is related. Do you mm -hmm. think that the market and the state agencies play a specific role in making mm -hmm. agrarian individualization in rural areas? And if it mm -hmm. is possible to study agrarian individualization empirically in the context of rural Indian society? Yeah, let me just uh, elaborate first on how the state is increasingly treating farmers as individuals. Uh, for example, the new, not new, maybe since the five, six years, uh, state policies or, you know, ways of promoting uh, farmers or supporting their, you know, access or enabling them, etc., are based on giving, uh, you know, loans or credit or what are called direct benefit transfers. Uh, to individual farmers based on their Aadhaar cards, the PAN numbers, and you know transfers are made directly to their individual bank accounts. So it is here that the farmers' acreage or the ability to access the market, etc., all that counts. So it is not a lump sum given to a collective that is distributed by any one agency, but directly by the state into their individual accounts. The state also treats them as individuals. For example, crop insurance is again based on individuals. So if you have a village where there are you know, 20,000 farmers, only 10 or 15 farmers may have the knowledge and the access to have gone and got crop loans. Then they know which agent would do it, which bank, et cetera. And therefore, when they face losses, most of them have not had this insurance and maybe within that, only a few of them would get it. So again and again, what you see is it is not the collective or the social whole that is at risk, but rather the individuals who has the capability and knowledge to access the state and, you know, uh, assert rights, or make certain demands on the state who is recognized. Uh, all the others then go into a kind of uh, what I have in my book called a shadow state, where they are not uh, visible at all, they are invisibilized itself. Uh, at the level of the market, as I explained earlier, it is the individual. There is no way in which a group of farmers, for example, farmers collective or a cooperative, can go and tell an agent, uh, give us something at a discount rate. They would never do that. They would uh, rather do it on an individual basis. And you see that consistently uh, when the, in say the agent who wants to give you a tube well, will say, okay, I will now uh, give you a tube well at my cost. That is, I'm giving you, giving it to you at credit. You take this tube well, uh, you grow something and that pro uh, you, you repay my loan, but you also give me the crops that you grow. Uh, etc. So again, you're, you're handling only an individual. Uh, I think because of this individualization, uh, I mean, not because of it, because there is this trend of individualization of farmers. Um, it is, uh, and as I've been arguing elsewhere, it is more and more important for us to study the farmer's household rather than only the farming, uh, or the farmer as a unit and the agriculture plot as a unit. Because you see much of the decision making, the stresses, the ideas, uh, the context, uh, all of them are played out within the context of the farming household, the family itself. Uh, so that individualization, for example, the family that has to strategize ha has a unit vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, what is the, your production resources, but what are your, what are your expenditure, you know, children who have to be sent to school, a daughter or a son who needs to be married, a house to be built. All these decisions then become uh, 
focused and loaded on to the household, which is also why we are seeing the household and the family emerge as really sites of great struggle and strife. Lots of violence also taking place. For example, when girls assert their rights, educated girls who want to access their property, or young youth who have gone to college who want to, you know, opt for marriages outside of their jatis, uh, or you know, children who want to make certain career choices, etc. All of these we see has becoming very contentious issues. The other thing that you see in the individualization of um, farming households relates to the way in which the aged farmers themselves are being treated or ill-treated. Uh, what emerged very starkly for some of us during the COVID was the extent to which large numbers of elderly people who are you know, very hardworking and who had actually built homes, you know, had productive lands, et cetera, were abandoned by their own children during these moments of crisis. And we're seeing that across time, where it has sons grow up and take over the land or have you know, new kinds of incomes, uh, because more and more we are seeing the rural non-farming economies coming to be um, children who have a little bit of land, but who would be working in shops or who would be a tractor driver or who would be a school teacher or anybody. Uh, there has their children come into the household and the family and the economy kind of plays out there. There are more kinds of expenditure demands. It is the elderly who are then being pushed out. So there is an individualization within the family also taking place where it is just the immediate uh, earning member and his or her children and not really the dependent elderly parents. Uh, so I think... Um, for all these reasons, it is very important to understand how individualization is playing out at the very uh, different levels. For example, we often see the political dynamics has working on you know, the caste basis, you know, the whole political machinery. It's very true. It, it, it works there where one leader you know, can mop up uh, the jati votes, etc. But you also see the way in which uh, that is uh, deployed at an individual level. Uh, the political entrepreneur who's standing either for the panchayat elections or for the assembly election negotiates with almost every family on their personal terms. Oh, does your son need a job? I will try and see how to get this person a job. You need a house? I will see how through the panchayat scheme I can get you a house built. So there is an individual, a targeting of the individual needs to then absorb them into the, you know, the larger system, system as such. So I think more and more attention needs to be paid to some of these trends. Right. Uh, so could you uh, tell us more about the integration separation spectrum of the rural agrarian into the political economy in the recent years? Yeah. This is a new uh, sort of um, term that I coined, uh, the integration se separation spectrum. It was something that I had to grapple over many years. Uh, has a way to how do you understand rural India, not only agrarian India, but rural India itself, uh, through not a primarily a, an economic prism or window, or through theories of transition, you know, the work, you know, capitalist, in, you know, capitalist interventions or the growth of capitalism and how changes take place, etc. I wanted to somehow understand all the complexities and contradictions of rural India through the multiple lenses, through the ways in which and changes were taking place also in multiple domains, not only just economic, but also social and political and ecological also. So I use the integration separation spectrum has a, has a, has a lens to understand not only the variations, that, that's why I call it spectrum, because of the tremendous heterogeneity of rural India, which is very stark from the high altitude belts of the Himalayas to the low-lying plains of coastal southern India, to all the very, very, very diverse agroclimatic zones and regions and with very different uh, political economic, economic histories uh, in, in all these areas. So to explain, uh, to understand that, I also use, uh, try to see how it is the integration of the varied regional micro or agrarian societies into the macro political economic structures triggers not only a process of integration into the larger political economy, but it also triggers processes of separation. And that explains the variations in different regions. 
For example, the inter types of integration, I try very simply, very broadly, I will uh, oversimplify this, is the uh, at least three kinds of integration. You can see the economic integration, which is the most commonly explained, which was initiated first by the Green Revolution, you know, and therefore that led to the different kinds of class groups that you've had uh, into the integration into the capitalist market uh, in, in, and therefore kinds of new economies. Uh, but you also have new other kinds of at least attempts to make uh, new kinds of economic, integrate rural India into new economies. For example, um, vast areas are now incorporated into uh, the global economies through extractive economy, for example, Orissa or Jharkhand, where the mining industries have gone in, in search of uh, uh, minerals, etc. Or the uh, new kinds of entertainment, for example, rural Rajasthan, which is enveloped into the new kinds of both national and international tourism industry. But that integration is adverse to the, uh, to the interests of rural and agrarian citizens. Adverse in the sense it is an appropriation of their resources at costs that are far below the real uh, prices. Uh, it's an appropriation of labor also, which is then underpaid, and an appropriation of the natural resources, uh, not only you know forests or minerals or agricultural produce, but also other kinds of resources. For example, the way in which water, you know, the rivers um, and other kinds of sources of water are being used. So when, when this kind of integration takes place economically, but you also have political because of the uh, competitive electoral demo uh, democracy means the, um, the voting machinery has, is, is, has made deep inroads into rural India. So the, uh, you know, as they participate in the political system, you also have all kinds of di dynamics about rights, about citizenship, or about you know, whether democracy itself is realized or not. Then you also have a new kind linked to this kind of democracy is the deployment by the government of a governmental, what Kalyan Sanyal called governmental, governmental uh, welfare, uh, welfare system in which there is the provisioning of public distribution through the public distribution system, the provisioning of grains, uh, you know, some kind of health systems of, for example, pensions, old age pensions, or the Anganwadis, you know, free food, et cetera, care for, or uh, infants, I uh, think. So it, in, in, with, in each of all this, what you see is, has they integrated into the state, into the larger political economy, you have forms of separation. For example, in just the way in which the Green Revolution and the new kind of economies have kicked into rural India, you have the separation of agriculture from ecology itself. Uh, through tube wells, the use of, you know, tractors, a whole lot of new machineries, no longer is, agriculture very eco-specific. So you could grow wheat not only in Punjab or in Madhya Pradesh, but you can grow wheat wherever you want, whatever the you know crop is in demand, for example, the way in which soya cultivation spread across various belts, only because there was a demand for it in the market, the way in which vegetables are being grown or fruits, for example, which are uh, which have high value in the market. Uh, so it defies the ecological specificity of a region. It's itself. So that's one of the first separations. You also have the separation of production from provisioning, uh, which is the kind of uh, also the food cultures people would have. Earlier, you would have food regional food cultures matched what was also easily grown or grown naturally in those areas. Um, that has, has been disrupted uh, both because of cultivation can change. For example, parts of uh, South India which grow um, crops which they don't consume at all. Earlier it would have been rice, say millet, finger millet, etc., or jowar, but many would now be growing wheat or sugarcane or, or things for the market. But for their own provisioning, they would depend on the public distribution system. Uh, that kind of disruption we are seeing across the belt, uh, which also uh, it feeds into one of the contradictions, which is why we've had increased productivity of crops, but malnutrition also persists. For example, in areas in some of the Madhya Pradesh, uh, Adivasi areas, uh, where we saw people had stopped growing them local millets, all kinds of other local crops, including uh, wheat, but where soya cultivation had spread. And soya is something that they do not consume. It does not agree with them at all, but they would just rely on very poor quality PDS uh, wheat or rice, and therefore uh, it would directly lead to malnutrition, which is also what we are seeing in parts of Karnataka, where people have stopped growing 
ragi, finger millet, and just eat rice because it's uh, given free. You know, large amounts of it are, are given free. And we're seeing that across several bells. Uh, so the, that is another kind of separation because of the integration into the larger economy. You also have a separation of uh, production from reproduction. Uh, in this case, it is very class-based. Uh, slightly more pro, you know, what are called uh, farmers, upper, you know, uh, not mid, larger farmers with larger acreages who had success in the markets. They, even if their production, which is the economic activities are in the villages, their families are now residing primarily in the local towns or even in cities, primarily for their children's education or because they build houses and the family no longer wants to live in the rural areas. It's the opposite for the very working rural working classes who, when they cannot get work or who do not have land or resources in the rural areas, uh, leave their families primarily women and you know children behind and migrate out to the cities. So their source of income would be the cities, of production would be the city, but reproduction will be happening in the village. So a separation, which is very, very, very varied across the two kinds of classes, this is extremes. Finally, you also have, which is linked to your earlier question, the separation of the collective, the village, not, not because it was a harmonious collective uh, earlier, but at least a sense of being a collective was there to, to increasingly of a separation of the individual from the village. A large numbers of villages now are really bedroom communities. Most of the working population, especially young men, um, travel, migrate out, even if it is for day, day jobs to all the surrounding towns, to the surrounding villages, uh, because of uh, better improved uh, roads and uh, public transport sports, they just come back sometimes to just uh, sleep in the so villages. But you see, they completely disengage from anything that is agriculture, but they're also very individualized. So their choices, their options, we're seeing this primarily among the youth who in their context of being highly individualized don't have a sense of belonging either to their own caste networks, but rather are defined much more by consumerism. For example, we are noticing the extent to which it is a film star fan clubs among youth that is much more popular rather than even the earlier belonging to the local uh, you know, jati or religious uh, deities or some kind of worship that would take place. Um, the extent to which um, rather than village festivals, it is, you know, some kinds of fads that are being uh, celebrated, uh, uh, you know, through these networks. So based very strongly on the kind of mediatized culture that is impacting especially the young. So this is what I have been trying to explain that for all the processes of integration, we have not paid attention to the forms of separations that rural India is experiencing, which also accounts for the intense forms of uh, conflict, for the multiple forms of violence, for example, violence against uh, low rank caste, not only Dalits. Um, to me, the integration separation spectrum uh, enables us to understand not only variations across India, but it also explains some of the contradictions, which one contradiction which I explained about increasing productivity of malnutrition. But in this context of, say, political thing, which is the biggest contradiction, if the farming community is the largest proportion of populations, they would also have the largest proportion of vote shares. But the number of people who represent the interests of rural citizens of the farming community is very, very low in the parliament itself. Despite the farmers' movements and even earlier before you know, 2020, the agitation outside Delhi had started, the demand or the request to have a farmers' commission initiated, to have you know, special agricultural budgets be made, all of these have fallen on deaf ears. So not only at the highest level, but even at the lowest level, you don't see farming interests being represented by the political system. For example, even in a gram panchayat that is functioning well, which has high allocations of funds these days, the focus really is only on construction. What? Because that is where the biggest leakages take place. There's very, very, very little uh, attention given to the rights of the most uh, disadvantaged, etc. So what then accounts for the what I call uh, 
uh, kinds of distortions of a, of, of, of a political system, of the democratic system, which had possibilities, uh, is then accounted for by the fact that there are these uh, complex forms of separations that are taking place at micro uh, worlds. So basically, the integration separation spectrum is to explain how micro rural worlds are fitted into a macro political economy with its own agendas and orientations but it creates kinds of uh, uh, complexities and contradictions in these micro rural worlds right thank you for explaining it so well uh, it was such a pleasure listening to that last question actually uh, as mentioned in the introduction by dipali you are also one of the founders of the network for rural and aggregation studies so uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about the objectives behind setting it up, as well as uh, its major contributions so far, and mm -hmm. you know uh, the further scope for agrarian studies in India. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I initiated this in 2010 when I was with the National Institute of Advanced Studies, and it was done with the support of uh, Professor Padmini Swaminathan, who was then at MIDS Chennai. Uh, we first met there and uh, the objectives were based on a very kind of very broad and simple study that I had undertaken with, in which I reviewed what is the state of rural and agrarian studies across India in the various universities and in the many centers and institutes. I was very shocked to find that since the late 90s, 1990s, many, many institutes and centers had actually closed departments or centers that were studying, uh, doing studies on rural India. Uh, because of, I think, the, you know, the rise of the global economy, the, you know, the kind of booming urban economy you had, the metropolises, you know, emerging in a big way, a lot of academic attention has gone to rural, uh, to urban India, especially to metropolitan India. So there was, with along with the urban turn, a uh, a neglect of rural and agrarian India. So it was in a way to address that kind of academic neglect to say that although rural India continues to be you know, a majority in terms of population and also given its significance at so many levels, um, that is inadequate academic attention and therefore that attention needs to be brought back and we need new energies, we need new lenses, new theories to understand all this. And therefore, you know, a, a network is required, which would not be a formal network, uh, but a network that comes out of interest. So uh, we are not a registered body. Uh, there is nobody who is paid to do this. It's been completely voluntary. And here I want to give full credit to Professor Richa Kumar of IIT Delhi, uh, who was not only with us during the first meeting, but the subsequent meetings. Uh, we've held several meetings over the past 11 years. Uh, in different places, always in official areas, uh, uh, you know, in uh, Chidambaram, in Tamil Nadu, in you know, Bhopal, uh, where this, where, then we've gone to Orissa, etc. Um, uh, the idea was really to enable even people in these official or you know, state universities and you know, semi-urban or even rural universities and institutes to engage with these issues. Uh, we have brought out four or five reports since then on trends for, for each of those years we've met. What have been the trends there? But we've also sort of articulated and worked on different approaches. For example, um, the last report we brought out 2020, which is the state of rural India, the subtitle is Beyond Productivity and Populism. Because I think much of understanding India itself was primarily through the prism of productivity that itself has had many problems. Um, there is also the challenge of understanding uh, rural India with all its possibilities and its potential, not the always seeing rural India has you know, a basket case full of problems, either caste or low productivity, poverty, et cetera. Uh, so with that, we also focused on, um, we wanted to uh, highlight both uh, ways in which people could share, you know, syllabi, uh, share pedagogies, uh, material, but also articulate alternative uh, policies for rural India. So we have engaged with some of the national groups, uh, translated, it's already been translated into Kannada Marathi Bengali pipeline, and they should be out sometime soon. Um, so this was a way for us to not only, it was not only academic, but also policy-based, 
but also broadly to be shared with the people whom we are, uh, you know, studying and uh, writing about. Uh, so to more and more to engage deeply with the ground level itself and with the, with the rural citizens also. And uh, here again, I want to say that uh, it wasn't just um, me or Richard. There is also another core group, the people from all parts of India who are engaged in it. We have a website in which all the documents are put in and it's uh, you know easily accessible by anybody. We hope over the years to sort of uh, to keep not only engaged, but to draw in more people, especially younger people who can understand rural India with all its nuances and its complexities, and also see ways in which we can contribute to actual economic, you know, political and policy uh, issues. Right. Uh, thank you, Professor Vasavi. Since you mentioned uh, Richa Kumar, so we had uh, just had a book discussion where she was a panelist. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a book uh, titled Agrarian Change in India, edited by Professor S.S. Dutka, and she was also a mm -hmm. panelist. Mm -hmm. And uh, doing sociology somewhere relates to what you're also doing in terms of being non-funded and voluntary work. So uh, thank you once again for taking time out to do this. Uh, I would also like to tell our listeners that uh, this is actually the third interview in our focus on agrarian sociology. And before that, we have also interviewed Professor Jyotka and uh, Bibi Mohanty. So maybe check out those interviews as well when you listen to Professor Vasavi. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. A pleasure talking to you both and all the best.